Contrary to popular belief, the human species is still evolving. Reproduction is not biased, it doesn't care about morals or ethics or politics, and it isn't selective outside of dominant and recessive traits. However, natural selection is the process in which evolution begins to shape an organism or group of organisms to more accurately fit an environment by rewarding those who display traits conducive to their surroundings with reproduction. I've delved into this many times over in various segments, such as when I discussed why Jews, specifically Ashkenazi, are, in my own words from two years ago, so darn smart, or why the Nilotes of East Africa have the darkest, slimmest, and tallest frames in the entire world, or why the Yagham, the closest indigenous people to Antarctica, can survive in frigid conditions and waters completely nude, in conditions that would kill the average person from anywhere else on the planet in minutes. And of course, to label the Jews or Nilotes as a race is somewhat subjective, but either way, advancements in human technology leading to mass migration has complicated the process of natural selection significantly. Thousands of years ago, living in India, who could have ever imagined that their descendants would one day roam the jungles of the Amazon? Did the Irish of the 4th century ever think that their progeny would be forced to a landmass literally on the other side of the planet? Could you, dear listener, imagine your great-great-great-grandchild exploring parts of the solar system that in the present day seems possible only in the concepts of science fiction? This is the equivalent of how utterly fantastic and sometimes bizarre global human migration patterns are, and how foreign these concepts would have been to our prehistoric ancestors. Now, contrary to what many people have suggested, including myself in the past, some anthropologists and geneticists argue that the human species is not actually converging into a single homogenous gene pool, but have suggested that mankind is actually diverging faster than ever, with diversity rapidly increasing as different populations boom and disparate peoples intermix, something we've seen several times with the expansion of the Bantus in Africa, Turks in Central Asia, or Europeans in the Americas. Now, keep in mind, for the vast majority of human history, language, and to a lesser extent, religion, were often very good indicators of not only self-identified ethnic kinship, but also genetic relations, which a lot of people, especially in Western countries, have a hard time understanding, since pretty much everyone learns the dominant language of the country, and self-segregating ethnic groups or autonomous regions are often looked at with great scrutiny, with a few exceptions, such as Quebec and Canada, or Native American reservations in the United States. So in today's video, let's discuss how global migration and intermixing will create new ethnic and racial groups that I believe have a very good chance of developing in the future if current trends continue and there isn't some kind of cataclysmic global disaster. Now, starting off, Latin America and possibly all of the Americas will very likely resemble Central or South Asia in the next few hundred years. Don't believe me? Take the Native Americans, descendants of highly disparate populations who converged into one over many thousands of years, and even the Inuit and Aleut peoples who have more recent Eastern Eurasian admixture not found further south still share a large proportion of their gene pool because of the ancestral continuum. So even though I always state in my videos that there's no such thing as the Hispanic or Latino race, in the distant future there really will be a Latino race, at least barring any sort of future mass migration from another region that could complicate the matter. I'd be willing to bet that far enough in the future, hardly any outsiders at all will be making distinctions between observable differences in the genes and phenotypes of different Latino groups, with few remembering that the bulk of the Caribbean population was African descended, or the bulk of Argentina was European descended, or even who the natives of the continents were in the first place. I could be wrong, but just look at India. A few thousand years after the conquest of the Dravidians, Indo-Aryans, and Austroasiatics, and very few distinctions are made between these different ancestry groups among outsiders at all, despite having quite distinct appearances, languages, and cultures. Another good example of this would be the Horn of Africa, or Madagascar, regions which, similarly to South Asia, have a long history of migration and intermixing between very different groups that have melded into a single population over thousands of years, no longer being seen as hybrid races by most outsiders, and even those who live in these areas. And to a certain extent, areas such as Central Asia already show high genetic clustering when compared to outsiders in only a thousand years of intermixing and divergence, with some individuals being closer to East Asia, 
others Europe, and others the Middle East. There are actually still large populations of full-blooded Africans still located in Latin America and the Caribbean known as the Maroons, the descendants of runaway slaves from hundreds of years ago who had limited their contact with the outside world for generations. And of course, there are also still unmixed Europeans in Latin America, with one such group being the Mennonites, an ethno-religious group similar to the Amish with communities in nearly every single country in the Americas. However, over hundreds or thousands of years of intermixing, it seems improbable that any pure ancestries will remain in the region of Latin America. As for their northern neighbors, most likely something similar will occur in the United States and Canada, only with a more divergent gene pool. And instead of there being discrete racial categories like there are today, instead there will be different de facto ethnic groups and social classes with varying admixture rates that will bleed into one another, again very similar to South Asia. I honestly think the racial identifiers of today will be a thing of the past, and although maybe not totally unrecognizable, the people of the future will definitely not resemble most phenotypes we observe today, and people seem to understand that intermixing between different populations is almost always inevitable, which is part of the reason we see so many groups going extinct, even though their genetic legacy lives on. Clearly, the age of the internet and standardized public education has created an environment of what I would call hyper-assimilation, wherein foreign ethnic groups with a completely different religion, language, and cultural background can become relatively undistinguished in the American public in only a generation or so, which, for the most part, would have been completely unheard of at the time around the country's founding. Even in the mid-20th century, a hundred years after becoming U.S. citizens, there were still many monolingual French speakers in the southern state of Louisiana who lived side by side with other English-speaking communities, but it wasn't until the state conducted a mass program of forced assimilation that they really became integrated with the rest of the country. This hyper-assimilation has made ethnic background largely irrelevant in the public sphere, with phenotype being the major identifying factor in the Anglo world today, although ethnicity still plays a lingering role in many aspects, even if we aren't consciously aware of them. Now, truth be told, I don't think any other areas of the planet would really look all that different since no area of the world is as diverse as the Americas, so I wanted this video to specifically focus on this region, but I did create this genomic chart of different regions of the world in the past, as described in my video over redrawing the continents, and as I discussed previously, here's a simplified genetic breakdown of each region. With a couple exceptions, such as East Asia and Northeastern Europe, there are very few genetically homogenous regions, whether it be due to ancient intermixing or more recent migrations from disparate regions, so it's safe to assume that excluding any massive, unforeseen global migrations, the genetic makeup of each region will gradually homogenize until each area is uniformly mixed. This will mean that due to the large number of recent Middle Eastern and North African immigrants in Northern Europe, if they are to become totally assimilated into the population one day, which does seem rather improbable considering the cultural and religious differences, then ironically, Northern Europe would be genetically closer to the Middle East than Southern Europe would be, although I believe that most areas of Europe will retain their original genetic base. Northern America, which includes the United States and Canada, will likely converge into a somewhat homogenized population that is mostly European, with a large Asian, African, and Amerindian genetic and cultural component. Component, and had this been just a couple hundred years beforehand, the English dialects spoken in each region would almost certainly become their own distinct languages, although internet access and telecommunications has mostly halted the development and spread of individual linguistic dialects. Because the creation of new dialects or languages is instrumental in the ethnogenesis or creation of new nations, it seems improbable that we will see new ethnic groups, even though, as I've mentioned in the past, many people in the modern day de facto self-segregate by perceived culture or people group, which I've dubbed a pseudo-ethnicity, such as with various immigrant communities to the US like Latinos, Muslims, or Asians, with all of these umbrella labels including very diverse assortments of people people, yet act as a single ethnic group in the public eye in many regards. Who knows what the future may hold in regards to how people self-identify. Most likely this will be a combination of appearance, geography, language, and religion, as ancestry is seemingly becoming more and more trivial to many not only in the western world, but all countries as well.
Now, am I saying that these new continental populations or future races will have the same degree of genetic homogeneity or clustering as the classical races that exist today? No, probably not. It's unlikely that future gene pools will ever become as isolated as our ancient ancestors. With Africans and non-Africans divided by 40 to 100,000 years, and Western and Eastern Eurasians divided by 20 to 40,000 years. But let's take this a step further. What will it look like not only when humans start diverging again, not based on continental or regional barriers like what occurred in the past, but rather due to vast separation and isolation due to the colonization of outer space? Who knows how far in the future that will be. Most experts predict at least another few centuries before mass interplanetary transit becomes a reality, and it will likely be thousands or tens of thousands of years after that when some of the bodies of the solar system, such as Mars, Europa, or Titan, could be terraformed with a human-compatible atmosphere, and this seems ample enough time to see significant and noticeable human genetic divergence and evolution. Granted, the human species doesn't go extinct before this, if we do become an interstellar civilization with permanent settlements on extraterrestrial bodies, we would likely see another mass divergence of culture, language, and genetics for each various planet, and on a scale of millions of years, Homo sapiens will begin to branch off into distinct species that will be incompatible with one another after a long enough time span. We certainly touched upon some very interesting concepts in this video, and I hope it's made you realize the transient reality of our culture and politics in the present day, and I'm just having fun with a lot of this. Maybe someone will create a movie or TV show with such a premise, but in the meantime, let me know your thoughts on the past and future evolution of humanity, and for today's poll, let me know which period of future evolution of the human species is most interesting to you. And as always, thanks for watching, this has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.